Should I start? Okay. Um, welcome again, everybody, um, to the second lecture on uh, the connection between fundamental physics and, uh, and galaxies. So let me start directly. Um, so I ended up the, the last presentation by noting that the, questions of dark, the question of dark matter is a very, very, very hard question. And uh, it's so hard that from the point of view of particle physics, there are dozens of orders of magnitude of possible parameter space for the mass of dark matter. People have come up with, uh, I'll quote-unquote say, theories, realizations of, uh, of, of a particle physics theory that essentially uh, realizes any one of these um, decades of orders of magnitude, or most of them. Um, but it's a very hard problem, and it's essentially a hard problem because most of the evidence we have is mean field evidence on dark matter, and it's gravity. And we also said that at the boundaries, okay, there is a bit of a delay. So we also, I also mentioned that the, there is a boundary, or there are boundaries, upper and lower boundary to this parameter space, and that by itself is striking. And these boundaries are actually being pushed by relentless efforts of theoretical and uh, observational um, uh, studies. And we are actually shrinking these boundaries. Their existent, existence, I think, is quite remarkable. And the, the interesting thing about these boundaries in both ends is that they don't rely on particle physics model details. They are just gravitation. Now, it should be clear, I, I'm going to pursue some of these, uh, these um, constraints. It should be clear that particle physics model dependence can, in principle, come in and change some of these conclusions. But then what you will be doing, you'll be model building to destroy something that is there automatically. You'll be model building to destroy just minimal gravity. Anyway, everything I will do will just be based on minimal gravity in this uh, lecture. And uh, in particular, I'd like to focus on the lower end. I just needed to choose one of these ends. I don't have time to cover everything. And so I chose the lower end. I should say there is a lot of work on the higher end, where the, the type of models that people are talking about are primordial black holes. I'll talk on the lower end, where people call this ultralight dark matter. And as I said, roughly the, um, per the mass of dark matter that we call ultralight dark matter is in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 20 electron, uh, electron volts, give or take a couple of orders of magnitude. If dark matter is so light, then it must be bosonic. It must have bosonic statistics, because otherwise fermions would be completely degenerate and would be very hot and free streaming. For, so for dark matter to be, to be cold at these energies, the angle. OK, so now you can actually hear. <laughs> All right. So um, the dark matter needs to, to have bosonic statistics. I'll decrease a little bit optimization. Is that OK? Okay, I think it's fine. It's great. Okay, okay. All right. So we are talking about bosonic dark matter. It's not going to matter very much. I'll, I'll talk about scalar fields. However, I will be doing non-relativistic dynamics mostly, and the effective non-relativistic dynamics is essentially the same regardless of the spin of dark matter. Then there are corrections and more complications if the field is a, uh, is a, a vector field, for example, um, and there are some opportunities if it's potentially a pseudo-scalar field, but the main dynamics I'll be talking about is, is uh, it, it doesn't matter what the spin of the field, uh, w well, if the field is a vector of scalar or pseudo-scalar. I'll focus on, on scalars for simplicity. So what is the general framework I'll, I'll be talking about? Just a minimally coupled scalar field. And what I'm having in mind, we are going to be talking about masses in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 20 electron volts. And so it immediately comes to mind that uh, from the theoretical physics point of view, we're talking about Goldstone bosons. Goldstone theorem makes it, in a way, relatively natural to produce very, very light state if some global symmetry is broken at some very high scale. Now, if the symmetry is approximate and not exact, you can have a small mass. Now, here's a good thing and a bad thing. This small mass can be as small as you want. <laughs> Um, because, for example, in many models, the symmetry is broken by uh, quantum effects, and if the symmetry is broken by quantum effect, the suppression of the mass, or the, the smallest of the mass, can be controlled by exponential, non-perturbative exponential factors. It can be extremely small. 
So the mass can be as small as you want. There are discussions in the literature how, for example, string theories can produce this kind of light particles, but field theories can also produce this kind of particles. It is thought. And so the, the archetypical example is an axion or axion-like particle, which has a cosine potential. So the, um, if you want, what, what is the relic of the fact that there used to be a global symmetry that is now broken, of course, you cannot really break a symmetry, right? So it is non-linearly non realized, and there remains a discrete shift symmetry. In short, you have a cosine potential of this form where phi is the field. I'm not going to care too much about the details of, the, of this potential, but at the lowest order of f, f is called the decay constant. The typical scale we think of this f is roughly the scale the high energy scale at which the global symmetry was, uh, was spontaneously broken. And so F is a very high scale. M is going to be a very, very small number, the mass of, of our particle. Overall, notice that this thing, M squared, F squared, is just a parameterization of the normalization of the potential. I could call this lambda to the four with some scale lambda. But there is a reason why I parameterize it like this, because the mass of the particle is going to be the parameter m squared that's in front. When you expand the cosine for small perturbations around some minimum of the potential of phi, then the second, the quadratic term, this f squared will cancel, and you have a mass m squared, for those who haven't looked at this, this kind of theories before. And now the equation of motion in an expanding universe is this one. Um, we just have a, a Klein-Gordon equation for this field. So that's the archetypical thing we have. And what's the cosmology of this kind of model? Cosmology is actually very cute and interesting. So I'm going to consider this equation of motion initially in some radiation-dominated universe, where the Hubble rate is very large, initially much larger than, for example, the scale m. And moreover, the universe is approximately homogeneous and isotropic, so spatial derivatives are going to be unimportant for the discussion initially. There are the usual adiabatic perturbations that are going to be important later on, but initially to understand what, is, what the average matter density in the universe is doing, it's okay to forget the derivative terms. And to consider initially a situation where age is much, much larger than m. Inevitably, as I crank up the redshift, there will be an epoch like that. Well, the dynamics is very simple. When age is much, much larger, the Hubble parameter, much larger than m, the Hubble parameter acts, people call it, it, it acts like a friction term, and the solution of the field is that the field is essentially fixed. It's stuck. Phi is a constant. So suppose I drew here the potential V of phi. Here the potential was cosine uh, phi over F. So imagine this is just one of these troughs of the cosine. The field starts at some point, given to us by some random initial condition, and it's just stuck there, as long as age is very large. Now, we like to discuss this Hubble friction, but when you think about it in a uh, radiation-dominated area, era, time is just one over Hubble. There is no other scale in the problem. So in fact, this field is stuck as long as the, as the time that this universe has lived is much smaller than one over m. As long as the universe has lived for less than one over m, the field is essentially stuck in a point in the potential. Once enough time passes, when t becomes much larger than 1 over m, or h becomes smaller than m, the field begins to oscillate. You can easily solve this equation in Mathematica from constant initial condition, dropping the derivative terms, and you will find the solution exactly, in fact. But you can also see, again, dropping these terms, when the Hubble term is much, much smaller than m squared, I'll have phi double dot plus m squared phi approximately equal to zero. The solution is just a cosine. See, phi of t would be just a cosine of t. These are just derivatives with respect to ordinary FRW time. And what the presence of the Hubble term does, it causes a slow adiabatic correction to the cosine mt solution, which I can write more than, uh, conveniently in terms of redshift z. Okay, so time, time evolution of the field phi of t enters here in two different ways. One, redshift evolution that is very slow when this solution is applicable. And second, are very fast oscillations. So the field is very quickly oscillating. This mechanism, where the field begins stuck by Hubble friction at some point, and then rolls down and begins to oscillate, um, this is called vacuum misalignment. And I should say, the context in which I'm going to be discussing this mechanism is when this field exists as a pseudo-Goldson boson way before inflation or during inflation, 
It's not produced, the symmetry is not broken after inflation. I will not touch upon this scenario at all. I'm just talking about vacuum misalignment that happens before inflation. And so these oscillations of the field, I'm literally just solving here in mathematica the equation of motion of the field starting from some initial point as a function of time in a radiation-dominated universe. So all of this, the, the initial production is homogeneous throughout the universe up to adiabatic perturbations that, as you know, are just essentially small time delays of the starting point of, of time for this problem. Great, so that's what this field is doing. It's oscillating. When the field is oscillating over here, when the Hubble parameter is much, much smaller um, than m, or when t is much, much larger than 1 over m, in fact, the effective equation of state of this field is the equation of state of dark matter. And you can see it because if you calculate the energy momentum tensor for the Lagrangian I wrote before, then mass density is phi dot squared over 2 plus the potential energy density, which in our case, to leading order in F, is m squared phi squared over 2. And the pressure is the same with the minus between them. Now, if you just plug the solution and ignore derivatives of redshift, there are corrections coming from redshift derivatives, but if you ignore and just take the time derivative, then to leading order, Energy density, you see, when you take the phi dot squared, the cosine becomes a sine. You have a sine squared plus cosine squared. So you have something that is very smooth. Energy density is essentially constant. Just decaying slowly, compared to the time scale m, it's decaying slowly, like z to the cubed, which is precisely what dark matter should do, right? The energy density should go like redshift cubed. The pressure, however, because of the minus sign, you have a sine squared minus cosine squared. You get a cosine 2 mt. The proportionality factor is the same as the energy density. So you have a large pressure, which doesn't look like what cold dark matter does. However, this large pressure is oscillating in amplitude between positive and negative signs. In fact, over short periods of time, this equation of state is actually the same as dark energy, right? It can become P over rho. Sometimes it's minus 1, yes, when this cosine is equal to 1. But then it reverses sign. The time scale of pressure oscillations is 1 over m, as we said, much, much shorter than the gravitational dynamical time, which is Hubble time. And so this pressure averages out. And so effectively, the system behaves like pressureless dust. I will have another comment about this point later when we get to galaxies. So that's the basic idea of the cosmology. We have something that behaves like dark matter. I haven't derived it, but another question you want to ask, do perturbations also behave like dark matter? The answer is yes. Perturbations on large enough scale in this uh, fluid behave also like dark matter perturbation should. So what you want to ask, I have a mechanism, misalignment, that produces a background density that behaves like dark matter. So can I calculate the contribution to the energy density today? And the answer is we can estimate it easily. So as we said, what, what do we want to do? What is the energy density in this dark matter component today? At redshift z equals zero. The energy density today is roughly the energy density at zm, z sub m, is the time at which oscillations begin. Okay, let's define this time by z sub m. So the energy density today is the energy density then, when you begin to oscillate, just redshifting with z cubed, okay? And I'm going to parameterize, suppose that the initial misalignment, the natural scale for the, for the field at initial misalignment is F. That's the only scale on the particle physics side, it's F. Let's, let's suppose that the initial misalignment is alpha times F, with alpha is some fudge factor of order one that I cannot compute from first principles. Okay, so alpha is some number that I don't know of order one that I'll carry along. And you've seen before the energy density is basically m squared phi squared over 2. So this alpha is, n, so what we get is alpha squared m squared f squared over 2 with the redshift dependence. Now, what is zm? What is this redshift? How do I find zm? zm is just the redshift at which the Hubble parameter equals the mass, roughly. We are talking radiation domination time, so Hubble parameter is t squared over m Planck. Again, label m to just mark this particular temperature. So I make the next step. Well, Zm is related to the temperature roughly by the ratio of the temperature at that time to the temperature today, T naught, just the temperature today, say uh, 2.7 um, degrees Kelvin. 
And if I just use this equation up here, then I have an expression for Zm in terms of the mass of my particle, little m, Planck mass, and temperature today. Take this expression for Zm, plug here, and you got an expression for the relic density today. Very simple. Vacuum misalignment gives you mass density today, which is this fudge factor, how different the initial field was from F, the decay constant, times known constant, temperature of, say, the CMB today cubed over M Planck to the three halves, times M to the half F squared. This is by now a very well-known relation. I can divide this by the observed dark matter density and have an expression for omega M, the contribution of this field for, uh, to the dark matter omega parameter, and what I find are the typical numbers that I would need to have for the decay constant F and for this uh, axion-like particle M to get the correct observed matter um, mass density. Okay? And this was celebrated <laughs> in a famous paper by Lam Hui and, and others. It was known long before that, but the, the point is that we have this parametric dependence. I think the reason that this was so attractive to these authors and to some authors later is that this scale, so for two reasons. First, as I will discuss later, there seem to have been astrophysical reasons to take seriously this region of mass, 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 21. For now, for you, this can just be a placeholder where the constraints exist if you want. So that is the value of m that is going to be interesting for us in galaxies, actually. And so with this value of m, to get the dark matter relic density correct, you need f that is around the gut scale, maybe the string scale. That was the thought that people were talking about. And so maybe this is some kind of a wimp miracle cousin, in a way. I don't know about miracles, but I know that this is the combination you get from vacuum misalignment. And it is interesting. It defines the ballpark we were talking about. Extremely high F and very small M are very interesting. So just to flush out some um, references that you can check out later. First, can string theory, for example, produce this kind of states? Is discussed here. The tentative answer seems to be maybe. And um, could we be celebrating the existence of uh, tens or maybe hundreds of such a very light state? The tentative answer seems to be maybe. And um, I would say one comment that you should be asking yourself, definitely I would be asking myself, if it is really so easy for nature, for string theory, moduli compactification, for example, to produce hundreds or dozens of these states, then, and if moreover, one of these states gives you the correct energy density, then why doesn't the other states completely overclose the universe? Right? This seems to be somewhat contrived to me. So, either though, so uh, why would they conspire to give you the observed energy density and just completely much more, much less. It sounds a little bit strange to me, but it is what it is. This is the ballpark we'll be talking about. Okay, so now I'm happy to make uh, contact with what Matteo was speaking about, and I'll just briefly comment about uh, non-galactic constraints on this model, but I'll derive it from a different point of view. So the main point is the following. At very large scales and very long time, this model is the same as cold dark matter. If the dynamical time of the system is much, much lo longer than 1 over m, then it behaves like just pressureless dust because pressure averages out, and perturbations collapse just in CDM. But if you look on scales that are comparable to the, the Broly wavelengths, commoving the Broly wavelength here of this state, then you begin to encounter wave dynamics of this state. You cannot really lo localize a particle on scale smaller than the Broly wavelength. So you can have an estimate when will wave dynamics jump in. Now, if you think about this Lyman alpha data and in general the formation of large scale structure, then what we have, we have some density perturbation delta rho. You can, because of Birkhoff theorem, you can essentially neglect everything outside of it. And so this density perturbation delta rho is collapsing under its own gravity. And as it is collapsing, it is going to produce peculiar velocity associated with it, just the velocity at which the matter is falling. And this velocity is roughly gm over r. r is the typical scale of the perturbation, and m is roughly the excess mass associated with this perturbation. Okay? So I can calculate what gm over r is, is for a perturbation delta rho, when the size scale of the perturbation is of order the Broly wavelength, then wave dynamic effects are going to be important. 
And now if I plug in what the lambda the Broly is, you see it is 2 pi over mv. So the same v goes back in. I can substitute the upper equation into the lower, and I simply have an, a, a statement. What is the typical scale of self-collapsing perturbations at which wave mechanics is going to kick in? And here is a funny thing for perturbations of the same order that we actually see for permodal initial perturbations at redshift of order 1,000, this scale is of order a few megaparsec for m in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. So the lower end kind of, of what I was speaking about before. A few megaparsec is observed by Matteo by the Lyman Alpha Forest analysis. It is very difficult for CMB analysis, but Lyman Alpha Forest can try to do that. The other thing that you can see is that the heavier you make the mass of the particle, the smaller the scale at which wave mechanics effects kick in. What does it mean? It means that the signal is stronger the lighter the particle is, right? The information will kick in at lower and lower wavelengths. There will be more data available. Smaller values of k are relevant, the smaller m is. So if Lyman Alpha Forest analysis, for example, want to set a bound, a lower bound on m, the strongest bound comes from the smallest scales or the largest k. So the bounds, this is the reason that the bounds are driven by the last data points in k. But these um, data points are really accessing the ballpark we are talking about. OK, um, there were several papers, I just referred to them, and I won't speak about them anymore. But the basic point is, from this, the argument I just gave you, value of little m of around 10 to the minus 21 is in serious tension with this Lyman Alpha Forest data as seen by many authors, there are other constraints from LSS and from CMB that follow the same methodology, or the same idea. Okay, now let me go to galaxies. So as we said, wave mechanics comes in on scales that are smaller than the Broly wavelength. How does it look like when you look at galaxies? Well, we can do the same exercise. We can now ask about a self-gravitating galaxy and ask what is the kind of system that is going to find itself inside roughly the de Broglie wavelength of this, op of this type of wave dark matter. And we can do the same, the same exercise exactly I did before. And what you're finding is a system of size R and mass M is going to encounter wave mechanics effects if MR is smaller than roughly 1 over G Newton M squared, or M Planck squared divided by little m squared. Plug the numbers in. M over 10 to the 9 solar mass times R over 1 kiloparsec needs to be smaller than inverse M of 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. So for these values of the mass, you're going to see wave mechanics for systems that have a mass of order 10 to the 9 solar mass and this and size of order 1 kiloparsec. And we've been discussing a system like that uh, yesterday, and that system was a dwarf galaxy Fornax. And in fact, it was noted and was highly exciting at the time that all of the dwarf spheroidal satellite galaxy of the Milky Way may be consistent with a kind of inner structure that looks like the wave mechanics effect that this dark matter is producing, that I'll discuss later on. This has led to a huge amount of excitement in the literature. Basically, what you're seeing here is the very exciting suggestion that the nature, the fundamental nature of dark matter, the mass, m, through just wave mechanics, the de Broglie wavelength, explains the size of these systems. We can actually explain something, maybe. So I can understand why this is so exciting, and I was very excited about this as well. Um, and so we and many, many other groups have, uh, have also started to investigate this problem. Good, so this is what we're going to study. We're going to study this phenomena in galaxies, at least one aspect of this phenomena. And to do this, I want to take a step back and look again at what we have here. What is the system of equations we are solving? What is the model? We are solving the um, Einstein-Klein-Gordon equation, so the Einstein equations for gravity, because it's a self-gravitating system, supposedly, coupled to the um, Klein-Gordon equation for the field, just a free field with mass m, neglecting any interactions that are not gravitational. These are Einstein, Klein, and Gordon. And now, we have a simplification we can make, because galaxies in the regime I'll care about are non-relativistic. Velocities are small, okay? much smaller than the speed of light. And so it's natural to expand the field in a non-relativistic limit. 
I can mod out fast oscillating phase into the IMT and just leave a slow varying envelope psi of, uh, of x and t. And the point is that the derivative of psi are much, much smaller than m. That's the point in this expansion, then it becomes useful. And so as long as derivative gradients are much smaller than m, I can expand the klein gordon equations by inverse powers of little m. And what I get is just the Schrodinger equation and the Poisson equation for the gravitational potential. That's the non-relativistic expansion. This is an enormous simplification, because instead of having two equations named after three people, we now have two equations named after only two people. But seriously, life becomes much easier. It's a first-order derivative in time. You can try to work this out. You can also try to apply methods from other systems trying to solve the Schoenner equation. One comment I should make, and I'm happy to get back to it later if somebody wants to know. This equation is a Schrodinger equation, but it is completely classical. Okay, I'll just say it once. The klein gordon einstein equation I started with are effectively classical. Because the field is so light, it is extremely degenerate. The occupancy number is enormous. In the unit of phase space, there are many, many, many particles. And so effectively, this field is tracking classical equations of motion. These are classical equations, and this is a completely classical Schrodinger equation that we are solving here. Nothing quantum about it. Good. For those of you who are really interested, I put in my slides a quick um, shortcut of the derivation. It's just fun to do it. Sit with Mathematica half an hour and do it for yourself, see what the, that you understand what's going on. Just write the metric. Write the field in non relativistic expansion. Calculate the equation of motion. Simplify. What you'll get will blind you for a moment. <laughs> Collect some terms, expand in 1 over m, and you'll get the expression that you want after some manipulation. It's a nice exercise to do. The reason I'm showing this is to make completely clear that we're talking about a non-relativistic effective field theory. There are many, many corrections up here that are completely calculable. In the end of the day, we didn't have to do this. We could solve, we could try to solve the full relativistic equation. But if we want, we have an EFT with many higher order corrections, some that I've dropped here. And they are subleading. It's a good exercise to understand why each of them is subleading. It's also an interesting exercise to understand when some of them might actually become important. For everything I will do, I will just neglect this and work here with the Schrodinger part of the equation. Just one more aside, Matteo mentioned this already. The Schrodinger equation is complex. This field psi is complex. Of course, we started with the real scalar field. We only need the real part of psi, but the Schrodinger equation really solves for the two components. It's a complex equation. We can cast it into fluid equations, effective fluid equations, using what is called the Madelung transformation, where we just say the field is, in my convention, is proportional to the mass density rho times the complex phase, and you find out the gradient of the phase is proportional to momentum of this field, or momentum flux. It's collective momentum, and you, get, you just plug this representation into Schrodinger equation, and you get fluid equation. Beware, you might be losing some physics when you do this. Why? Because notice that this phase transformation becomes undefined when the density is zero. And for this kind of field, there will be regions where the density is really zero, because there are interference patterns. So you might be missing vortices when you do this Madelung transformation that would, in fact, be naturally kept if you're solving directly the Schrodinger equation. That's just one comment. I'm not going to be using this representation anymore. Good, so we have a set of equations. People can do numerical simulations, not me, but uh, people can do numerical simulations. For example, Luca in my group, who is sitting here in the audience, can do this. And so, as I said, there was a huge excitement about the possibility that dwarf galaxies are constructed from this system. And so people simulated what is going on, starting, I think, the most fantastic initial simulations were by this, from, uh, by this Taiwanese group, by Shi et al. from 2014. They ran, honest to God, cosmological simulation with this Schrodinger um, Poisson solver. There are many, many interesting results from these different simulations that we have today. They have advanced with time. I'm just choosing to focus right now on one. We'll talk about another basic property later. The one thing I want to focus about is the fact that look, all of these simulations of ultralight dark matter galaxies share a property, more than one, but one important property, all of them, in the center of the halos, have this bright spot, this core solution. Everybody finds it. 
It's um, ubiquitous in all simulations. Let me give you an example from a simulation by uh, Luca Teodori and Marco Gorghetto in my group. What I'm doing here, we are starting, we're solving the Schrodinger Poisson equation. It's a self gravitating field. We solve it in a, on a grid. And you start with some initial condition and you let the thing collapse. It's a periodic box. And as you can see, you form this kind of halo structure. And in the center, if I would zoom in, you would see that there is a core profile, just the same as in the other simulations, same type of profile. I start with a different initial condition. You're going to end up, after some relaxation time, with a very similar profile. And again, the very inner part has this bright spot, which is a core solution. Now, when you look at the problem in this way, in linear scale, you might say, OK, this is not very important. But what you should do, you should remember, when we look at galaxies, we have a very large variety of scales in which we have data. We access data from parsecs in some galaxies to hundreds of kiloparsecs. Okay? So we can actually sometimes resolve this kind of small scale. And as you will see, this effect could be very important. So here's an amusing fact. As I said, all simulations with self-gravitating dark matter forming a galaxy, they form this core structure. If I zoom in, you can see that what I'm doing here, I'm taking three different simulations, different initial conditions, different galaxies, and I'm scaling them with some scale transformation that I don't have time to discuss here. I'm scaling them to sit on top of each other, and you can see the following thing. On very, this is radius distance from the center of the system, distance from the center of the core, and this here is essentially the density. In the inner part of the system, all simulations agree to better than 10% on the shape of this inner part of the core. In the outer part, there is um, escape from this self-similarity that is reflecting the initial conditions, the mass of the system, and so on and so forth. But the inner part is an excellent agreement. This is very remarkable. It's remarkable because the inner part, in fact, is calculable. It's calculable, and I don't need an n-body simulation to really calculate it because the inner part is, in fact, a ground state of the Schrodinger Poisson equation. Okay, so to understand it, let's do a radial averaging of the system and consider the problem in spherical symmetry. Then the Schrodinger Poisson simplifies. I'm also going to do the following thing. It's an observed fact that on the small scale here, the field is coherent. Phase variations are much, much smaller than pi. And so I can take a coherent ansatz. You see, I split the field into a time-dependent envelope times a radial part. This is just to represent reality. We see this kind of profile in the simulation. Then the equations simplify a lot. This equation you can solve on your laptop in a fraction of a second to find its ground state. And I'm plotting the ground state here in black. All numerical simulations of ultra-high dark matter, self-gravitating, mimicking a galaxy, in the inner part, they form this soliton core. The soliton core is an attractor of the equation of motion. It minimizes energy at a given mass, so it has some stability properties, and it always forms, or very ubiquitously form. And every, everything, all simulations agree, and I can understand it semi-analytically by just solving this simple set of equations. Now, we have nothing like this for CDM. That's an amusing fact. NFW is a name that the profile people use for um, cold dark matter. It's just a name for a numerical result coming from simulations. Okay? There is no, at, as of now, analytical understanding of why it is forming. This is very special. Because of wave mechanics, we really do understand the structure of this initial part. There is a lot we don't understand. There is some stuff we really understand. I'll show you why this is useful. I'll skip this analogy with BEC, but there is a strong analogy with the BEC, with the non-local interaction. OK, so essentially all simulations form a core for galaxies, for example, the simulations from this group, but there is more to it. According to this group, the core not only forms, but it forms following a certain scaling relation which is as follows. So in fact, the amount of mass that this group is finding that is confined in the core structure, people call it soliton, the, the initial coherent uh, state. So the amount of mass in the core is the y-axis on this plot. And here on the x-axis, what this group is plotting is a property of the entire simulation box, a property of the entire halo. 
It's the ratio of the total energy to the total mass in the entire box. And what they're finding in this simulation, this is not a cosmological simulation, but according to this group, they find the same thing in cosmological simulations. What they're finding is the energy per unit mass of the large-scale halo, right, that contains a lot more mass than there is in the core, the energy per unit mass is very strongly correlated with the mass of the core. Now, the plot at this level is purely empirical. There is no full understanding of why there is this strong correlation. But now let's use a little bit of analytic insight to say something about it that I think is quite interesting. I'll have also comments about how robust this is and uh, what variations on this could be. There definitely are comments to make about this. But let's understand this result. It's a major result in, in this literature. So, I said, we understand this profile. We can calculate it on a laptop. Then we can calculate some other things. For example, the total mass, and now I'm not talking about the entire box here. I'm talking about just the analytical ground state right? that I showed before. I can calculate some integrals of it. I can calculate the total mass under this ground state. I can also calculate the total energy of this ground state. If you do it, you observe some relation between the total mass and total energy. In fact, the mass of the core of this solution is actually proportional to the square root of the energy divided by total mass of the same solution. It has some scaling properties. This is algebraic. It's just a relation between these integrals that I can compute immediately. And what you find is the following, this scaling, purely empirical scaling relation by the, um, this uh, simulation group is in fact exactly reproduced by the following condition. The energy per unit mass calculated numerically for the entire halo is equal to the energy per unit mass of the ground state. I think this point is extremely simple. There are no fudge factors here. The prefactor is one on both sides. The empirical correlation, co-halo relation that the simulation found is summarized simply by this statement you can get on Mathematica in a fraction of a second if you write the right integral. Okay, E over M equals E over M. This may hint of a trouble, it could also hint that they are right, but what is in, in important here is to understand, we really understand, we can calculate some properties, we can simplify some of these relations, and this relation is just summarized by that. Other soliton halo relations in the literature can also be simplified in this way, and it may help us understand what's going on though. Another exercise you can make, total energy in um, a gravitating system is actually not defined. None of these codes, for example, have any physical reference to the absolute value of the po Newtonian potential, right? You can change, the, if you want, the zero of the Newtonian potential without changing anything in the dynamics, but you will change the energy because the Newtonian potential times the mass density gives you a contribution to the energy in the box. So total energy is not physical. Kinetic energy is physical, though. And for a virial ground state, kinetic energy is just minus the total energy. So what I wrote before can also be cast as a physical relation. Kinetic energy of the core is equal to kinetic energy of the halo. So we can understand some things analytically. Another comment I just uh, gloss over, you can ask, OK, we see these cores in simulations. Simulations are difficult to understand. Do we think that this course should really be produced? Do we, do we have some analytical or semi-analytical insight that these core solutions really should form um, in galaxies? And the answer is yes, with the caveat. This formation of the core should happen, but it's bounded by the age of the universe, the mass of the halo, and the mass of the particle we are discussing. Okay, I won't get into this problem now. I may mention it tomorrow, but the main point is that, as you can see in this um, rendering of the mass of the field, there are fluctuations in the mass. They are just, again, wave mechanics fluctuations. They act as quasi-particles. They interact gravitationally with each other. And so they mediate dynamical relaxation. You can calculate the relaxation time, you can, and you can check if the relaxation time is much shorter than the age of the universe for the systems, the galaxies we're talking about. The answer is, for certain galaxies, for example, dwarf galaxies slightly less massive than the Milky Way, and for particle mass in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 21, this system should virialize through this dynamical relaxation, and it should, in fact, produce this core. We understand that. If we go to much larger particle masses, relaxation is going to be hard. We don't expect these cores to form. 
Showing this relation in simulations is still a, pro a problem in progress. But all what I can say here is that we understand the time scale. The time scale is consistent. These cores really should form if the particle mass is small enough. Okay, so I go back to simulations. What can I do with this kind of core halo relation that I can just summarize like that? So kinetic energy density, kinetic energy per unit mass is just velocity, velocity squared. And so equality of kinetic energy per unit mass, what does it mean? It means kinetic energy per unit mass of the host halo is dominated by very large radii. If you want this peak of the rotation curve in, say, an NFW profile, in the Milky Way, this would be of order of a few tens of kiloparsec. Kinetic energy per unit mass of the soliton core is dominated at very small radii, comparable to where the core is. If you remember in this um, density plots, the core was this small point and the halo was much larger. So there is a large separation of scale be between velocity maxima. So what we did, we can go to the numerical data and we can actually calculate numerically the rotational velocity for simulated fuzzy dark matter galaxies. And this is an example for one paper, this is an example from another simulation. And what you can see is that if you plot the rotational velocity of these galaxies, it actually has this double-peaked structure. The outer peak is essentially ordinary NFW-like profile. The inner peak is the soliton. So I superimpose on this the soliton expected from soliton halo relation for that halo. So you see, there are small differences between these curves, but roughly they have a double-peak structure. And importantly, roughly, velocity very far out. See, this is logarithmic scale. Velocity is a tens of kiloparsec, reproduced at sub-kiloparsec for these models. How am I on time? Okay. Good. So that's really cool, because now we actually have a potential observational prediction. Rotation curves for this kind of galaxy should be double-picked, or at least Velocity very far out in the halo should reproduce in the inner part. And you can do this for uh, many other systems. This is what I do here. These are 11 halos to check how different simulations differ in the rotation curve. Here I'm normalizing the velocities from all simulated halos to match at a rescale radius, and I see how the velocity far away is changing. For some galaxies, the velocity far away is a little bit higher than inside. For most of them, it's comparable or smaller. There is really this double peak structure in all simulations. Great. So let's explore some of the implications for, galaxy for, this, for galaxies for this model. What I'm showing here is the rotation curve or the enclosed mass profile deduced from rotation curve for the Milky Way. We compiled it for a lot of, of data, radially average profile. And so this is the Milky Way, distance in parsec and mass in, in solar mass. And, whoops. So let's see what CDM is expected to do. For example, this is a vanilla NFW profile fit of the Milky Way by this group in 2015. And the point is that, as we've seen in the previous lecture, cold dark matter is thought to, maybe, to, to mainly control the rotation velocities at very large radii on galaxies like the Milky Way. The inner part is star dominated, stellar dominated. What happens with ultralight dark matter? Suppose the mass is 10 to the minus 22, and suppose I take seriously the soliton halo relation. I can calculate what the rotation curve should look like just from the contribution of the core. Okay, the rest would be a match sewing together this profile. The dashed line on large scale, the system will behave like NFW, and on small scales, it would be this characteristic core. So what you can see, this ULDM will affect the inner part of the rotation curve. But actually, the soliton halo relation is more fun because it's scaled with mass, the whole statement was about rotation velocities, and it didn't say anything about little m. The fact that the rotation velocity will hit you again later on is true even if the mass is larger than 10 to the minus 22. If there is relaxation and there is this core Hauer relation, whatever the mass is, you're going to kick the rotation curve at some point at small distances. So a broad range of masses is potentially observable in a Milky Way-like system, or it should have some effect in a Milky Way-like system. And actually, there was uh, some excitement about this by the Shiv group and others. It may be a bump in the rotation curve of the Milky Way. Could be attributed to the same dark matter mass that could explain dwarf galaxies, right? That would be amazing, because you predicted from um, dwarf galaxies, you find it in the Milky Way. 
Unfortunately, the Milky Way is a very complicated system. There are many stars in the Milky Way. For example, if you track photometric studies of the Milky Way, there are very likely about a billion stars in this region. It's a nuclear star cluster, so it's very hard to say if what you're seeing is this ultralight dark matter or something else. So what you want to do is look at other systems, potentially cleaner. This is a, a low surface brightness disk galaxy. It is hopefully suffering much less stellar and baryonic contamination. There are many, many other galaxies like this. There are hundreds of galaxies like this that are reasonably well measured. And we can look for the same by there. So what I'm doing here, I'm plotting for this galaxy, the rotation curve. This is radius, this is velocity. These are measurements. Soliton Halley relation tells you the following. If you give me the velocity at the outer part of the galaxy, ultralight dark matter at this mass predicts that there should be a velocity feature at the inner part. And I give it a large uncertainty. Okay? And so you open the data and you ask, what do you see? <laughs> and this is what you see in this cleaner system. So this feature should have been here, but it's not. This prediction and the test with data reminds me a lot of LHC analysis, actually. There should have been a bump and there isn't. Just imagine to yourself for a moment that there was the feature there. This could have been a spectacular particle physics-like detection of fundamental physics. But there wasn't. So there is a limit. Always in astrophysics and in galaxies, you want statistics. Any particular system can be some crazy outlier with a funny history. But as I said, we have hundreds of these galaxies. Not one of these galaxies that are well measured and well constrained in terms of the stellar dynamics and the gas, etc., shows a convincing uh, hint of this feature. Many are fully inconsistent with it. So we have good evidence against this kind of model at this mass. In fact, all the way to 10 to the minus 21 electron volt. Okay, so how much time do I have? Am I out? Two minutes to the 50 or to the hour? No, it's controversial. I'll take, I'll take two minutes. I'll, all right, I'll take two minutes. I mean, dark energy can work on Hubble scales. It's fine. So, good. So, th but, so this is one analysis. It establishes this lower bound with some robustness. There are many complementary observables. One of them, of course, is Lyman Alpha Forest, fully consistent with this, uh, with this bound from galaxies. There are other constraints coming from the wave fluctuations of the model. I'll discuss uh, tomorrow, if I have time. There are more signatures on galactic scale that just flash out, and you can read these papers in, um, in, in my transparencies um, offline. So, in fact, as I said before, there is this oscillating pressure. Oscillating pressure produces time-dependent scalar gravitational potential, the Newtonian potential oscillating time. This induces a signal in pulsar timing arrays, and the signal is being searched for. Right now, the constraint from this is weaker than other constraints, but it is promising in the future. There is more. If we have a soliton in the center of galaxies like ours, if the mass of the particle is very large, of the order of 10 to the minus 21 here at the boundary, there could be condensation of this core in the very inner part near the black hole. This would affect the motion of well-measured stars. There are also constraints from black hole observations that I'll skip here. Maybe I'll come back to it in the end if I, if I, if I can do it. But just with a word, Event Horizon Telescope of measurements of the shadow of the black hole in galaxies like M87 nails the inner mass in the very, or the mass in the very inner part of order 10 to the 10 kilometers in the galaxy. But there are stellar dispersion measurements also farther away at around 10 to the 16 kilometers, six orders of magnitude in distance. What we can do by combining these measurements is actually show that there is essentially nothing in between them. There is no room to put this kind of dark core in between. All these measurements constrain the mass of ultralight dark matter at regions that are actually interesting for the soliton halo relation, but there is a lot of theoretical uncertainties that we are working on. It may, we don't know if the presence of the supermassive black holes makes the field condense more, or does it consume the field by absorption, and does it disperse the field and prevents condensation? We don't know. This is a theoretical problem. It may be that there is a very strong constraint or a possibility of detection from the system, but this is very interesting observation to study the field. So I think I'll finish. I'm out of time. Um, I just flashed out to you one observational um, 
way to search for ultra dark matter with gravity alone in some detail, and a few others in much less detail, but there are many. There are numerous ways to try to look for, uh, for this model with gravity alone. And, um, okay, I hope this is interesting. And, uh So I was wondering whether um, your exclusions based on this uh, host-halo relation are robust with uh, relative to recent work showing that there's this diversity in this intrinsic scatter to this relation found by various simulations. And do you still believe that in light of this uh, scatter predicted by this recent work, that this interpretation of the repetition of the rotation curve patterns in the soliton and the halo remains? I mean, could you still think of it that way? Yes, I think, I think it is rather robust. Because if you look, uh, I think there is a lot of room to, to pursue this further. And also, it's very important to say, we don't fully understand the theoretical origin of the soliton halo relation. We have some understanding, but we don't fully understand it. Let's see if I can flash back enough just to show you what I mean. So, here is the point. Th there, are, there were different simulations, also in our group, trying to reproduce this soliton halo relation. Generally, the agreement is not exact. People are finding different solutions. I, by the way, urge all these groups to try to understand analytically what they're, f what they're finding. Again, the Shiv result is k over m equals k over m. Which is very clear, no fudge factors. Maybe hinting that it's true. <laughs> Maybe hinting that it's wrong but very important. You can try to do this for other simulations, but all of these calculations agree that the core forms, all of them agree that the cores form, if it is within this uh, dynamical relaxation time scale that you can calculate, and the deviations between them are at the level of a factor of two, and in fact, the shift relation is typically on the low side. Many of them produce more. Our group seems to be finding slightly more mass in the soliton, but it tracks the soliton halo relation to a reasonable approximation. Now look at the data for many of these relatively clean galaxies. What you see, for example, in this random system, the velocity that you observe in this region is at the ballpark of 10 to 20 kilometers per second. The velocity predicted by the vanilla relation is order of 50 kilometers per second. So there is a factor of anywhere between, say, 3 and 5 between the observed rotation curve and the predicted one. A factor of 5 in velocity is a factor of 25 in mass. This relation is failing by a factor of more than 10. There are galaxies where it's failing by a factor of 100. There is no galaxy where you actually see it. So I would say absolutely certainly, well, as absolutely certainly as I can say about this kind of astrophysical data, that we are not seeing positive evidence for this. What would I like to see, right? I would like to see theory predicted based on dwarf galaxies, we look at a totally different system, and we see it in our face, right? You would want to see these features in all galaxies, essentially. You don't see it in any galaxy in this range of mass that you have. So I think it's pretty robust. I think the variations in uh, the core halo relations are not very cru um, crucial for that. They're crucial, maybe, or they're important to say if the limit is 10 to the minus 21, or 3 10 to the minus 22, or 3 10 to the minus 20. That's kind of uh, where it's important. But they're not changing the fact that we're not seeing this. We should have been seeing it, we're not seeing it. The other point that is important is, as I said, our complementary observables. These constraints are totally compatible with Lyman alpha analysis and with other limits that I'll, I'll discuss tomorrow. So I think we looked for this thing, we didn't see it. I mean, let's, let's face it. We can walk until tomorrow to try to save it, but we're trying to save it. It didn't show when it should have. Okay, thanks. So thank you uh, for your talk. Um, actually, I was wondering about the possible variant effects for maybe affecting the host uh, soliton halo relation. Right. Very good question. What about baryonic effects? Um, because I was calibrating the soliton halo relation from well, fuzzy dark matter simulations alone with no baryonic, baryonic physics. And th the answer is we need to investigate this better. This is an important question. What I can tell you that we went, and other people went, into these uh, low surface brightness galaxies, 
And they're inside, in this data set of, of order 200 galaxies, they are of order a dozen or a few dozens that are very clean. The contribution from stars and gas today is much, much smaller than the predicted mass. So it's much, much below what is predicted. Um, and then we can calculate things like, for example, we can calculate what is the soliton profile in the presence of this kind of baryonic contribution, and it's essentially not affected at all for this subset of clean galaxies. And the constraints seem to be pretty robust in this sense. Now, there is the possibility, in principle, that there were many, many, many more stars, much more stellar mass in these galaxies at earlier times, somehow precluding the formation of the soliton, and then it was blasted out by feedback. Maybe, but you would need to blast out a factor of 10 of the mass. You are there with 10% of the mass that, that was there initially, which sounds hard, but important to, to study this. So I think this is a very important question, and I think this is an important uncertainty to, to try to figure out. I, should, I mentioned one paper, there is a site to one paper, that actually studied how the formation is affected in simulations that have also st stars in them. And it looks like the stellar mass actually makes the soliton a little bit larger. It forms a bit, a bit easier. Uh, thanks for the enjoyable lecture. Um, the initial conditions are related with the CMB and isotropies in this case? Yes. This well, uh, in some of the simulations, yes. So the cosmological simulations are seeded by you take initial conditions at redshift at high redshift that are just coming from linear perturbation theory from the same models that uh, that give you the CMB perturbations and then you evolve them. Most of the simulations are miniature copies of this, but some are full cosmological. For example, some of the Taiwan group and some other recent simulations. Okay, great, thanks. Yes. So uh, my question was a bit about the stability or of the soliton. So I guess you all in, in all the simulations you find that it forms, but then uh, um, is it like if you run it to lower redshift, like does it s stays there, yes. or it's sensible to you know major mergers or things like this could uh, somehow? Good question. So the first in the simulation, it's there and it's it stays there and. Again, from just basic properties of these differential equations, we know it is, a it, is a, um, it is protected by a certain stability theorem because it's an energy minimizer. It wants to form and it wants to stay there to some extent. What will a major merger do? I don't know. Could it mess this up? Potentially, yes. Um, it would need to have done it in all the galaxies we looked at, right? So for the constraint to be lifted. Um, but it's an interesting question. Can it, can it uh, change answer? I'm thinking about it. So for example, you say that uh, you form solitons in well, dwarf galaxy type, no? like 10 to the 9 uh, kind That of was the original motivation, yes. Yeah, uh, so you fi find them there. And if these things then fall to a larger halo, then you should find subhalos with, uh, I mean, in the central there wouldn't be a soliton, but the subhalos would have like a soliton in the... That's possible in principle. I can, I, can, I can see this happening. So wherever this dwarf halo is going, the, the subhalos could be solitons. There would be, in this model, when you ask about the power spectrum of subhalos, it is cut off. Instead, in, in fact, this whole phenomena of this core is highly nonlinear. It happens in a nonlinear regime. In the linear regime, it is actually replaced by a cutoff because there is no linear, there is a, an effective gene scale that I discussed before regarding the Lyman alpha, which prevents the presence of many of these small subhalos. So we don't really think, I think, that there is a zoo of these small subhalos. There is actually a lower, a lower bound on the mass of a self-gravitating structure. And again, the claim to fame of this model was that the lower, ma lower bound was compatible with all the dwarf galaxies that we see. Right? They're all compatible with the minimal object that you can make, the minimal soliton. There is a minimum self-gravitating solution. Um, but now, again, this, this determination is uh, in tension with the independent measurements like uh, Lyman Alpha and these galaxies. So I think it is more or less out of the window. Thank you, Akfir. So maybe we should move on and uh, to the last talk or the next uh, talk of Doug.
it working? Yes, it works. Good, great, thanks. Welcome to the third lecture. This is too strong. So apparently I have a Hubble time, right? You confirm? You give me five minutes before Hubble time, huh? Not good. Great, thanks. So, um, yes, yeah, we third lecture and we continue with uh, something beyond Einstein's gravity. But let me take uh, 30 seconds for advertisement. I like to write science outreach, unfortunately, only for the Italian speakers, but I know that there are several Italian speakers around, so in case you're interested in having, uh, or maybe <laughs> to some of your friends, to let them know what exactly you're doing, then you can try with one of these books. Okay, close the advertisement section. Let's continue. The recent books, one is actually published two months ago. Good, so um, I guess Spanish people can easily understand that as well. <laughs> or maybe I'll translate it in Spanish at some point. Good, so this is a summary and a clarification because I got some questions. So we're discussing actually two things you might have realized, acceleration and modified gravity, and something that modifies gravity. They can be connected, but not necessarily so. And you can say, for instance, a cosmological constant, it's a sufficient condition to have acceleration, but it's not necessary. You can have acceleration without a cosmological constant. You can introduce a field, a uh, scalar field or not. It's necessary, you want to modify gravity, but it's not sufficient. You can introduce a field and it just sits there. It doesn't give rise to a new interaction. And uh, so, overall, what I tried to say so far is that there is, uh, we likely are interested in introducing a new field because it could explain both acceleration, it could also give some interesting a way to test gravity beyond the standard Einstein or standard Newton. It can do that, it can do that, but doesn't necessarily have to do both, and maybe neither one of them. So you can discuss uh, whether a field is modifying gravity even without connecting that to acceleration. Of course, it would be nice to make this connection because then it's much more powerful, much more interesting, many more, much more, many more constraints. But uh, we can also, even if we decide that the cosmological constant is totally fine, we're happy with it, then still we can be interested in testing gravity just because we can do it and it's interesting to do and it can be a discovery there. All right, so that's essentially a summary and a little clarification. Now, you remember we at some point reached this candle leader monster here. Now, what do you do once you have a Lagrangian where you define, uh, you can derive equations of motion, you end up with some modification which looks just Einstein, except these things here is terribly complicated. And you can also obtain very complicated field equation from the conservation equation of this new energy momentum tensor. So formally they look like just uh, Einstein, but uh, this T mu nu here will also include itself R and things like that. So there is a coupling between uh, uh, field and, and gravity, or you can also say simply that matter is feeling an interaction from both uh, the gravitational part and the phi part. But formally you can still write in this way. Of course, I will not necessarily have to do, actually, I will not do any of this step because just you end up with a complicated set of equations. But just to convince you uh, or to explain to some of you that are working in this area that indeed that Lagrangian contains almost everything. You can find many limits. If you put uh, this number to constant there, then you recover ordinary gravity and you can have a non canonical kinetic set. You can recover, of course, lambda CDM. You can recover Brasdicki, you can recover the original Brasdicki if you make uh, every assum assumptions like this. I, I'm not really going to any detail, just to say that you can take many limits and recover maybe some of the theories that you've been working on or you will encounter in the literature. They, most of them are essentially corners of, of the, of the Hordeschi-Lagrangian. Uh, you can also recover the so-called covariant Galileon and so on and so forth. So you can have fun right, to recover most theories that people have been discussing even today in the past few days un under different names. Right, but why? I don't see. Sorry. Oh. Okay, still. I don't know why. I don't see the usual view on my screen. Okay. Now, why is this so second order so important? I stress the fact that this is a, gives rise to second order equation. There is a very interesting theorem about that is that typically if you start with a Lagrangian that contain, uh, contains higher order uh, terms, derivatives, then you end up with, uh, with an instability, a really the profound kind of instability. Imagine you have a quantum mecha a mechanical, just mechanical Lagrangian which is not just position and velocity but also acceleration, which we never encounter in physics, fortunately. And the reason why we never encounter a Lagrangian that depends on acceleration is because when you write down, well, when you write down the equations of motion, the other Lagrange, you get fourth order terms. You see second order here and fourth order there. Unless 
this Q double dot enters in a non-essential way, for instance, linearly, then this quantity here will be a constant and then you don't have that term. So you end up with equations of motion which are fourth order. But when you write down the Hamiltonian of such a system, defining uh, moment, uh, uh, canonical coordinates and, and, and generalized momenta, you discover that this uh, Hamiltonian is not quadratic as the one we use and we read in every textbook, but it's actually linear in at least one of the momenta, one of the conjugate momenta, P1 in this case. In that case, an Hamiltonian which is linear in momentum means that there's no any, uh, ground state. You can have uh, 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 energy states that go down to minus infinity, which is uh, the most catastrophic thing you can, you, you can insert in nature. Because if you have no ground state, it means that you can create a huge amount, an uh, infinite amount of positive energy particles just by stealing energy from lower and lower states. No limit to that. So that would be a totally catastrophic situation. There's no way our universe can, is, can exist if one field has, a, uh, has no ground state. So in order to avoid this, the simplest solution, there are some solutions, where the simplest one is to avoid higher order terms in the equations of motion, to stick with second order equation of motions. That is a profound statement, and we have to we, we use that for to derive the the, the or the Lagrangian. Otherwise, there will be no limit to creation of new, more complicated Lagrangians. We need to ensure at least some this basic sort of stability. It's not the only thing you have to ensure. We'll see later on, but certainly you have to start uh, with that. Now there are some caveats on that. Uh, this dangerous term is actually can be absent in what people like to call degenerate states, which means simply that you cannot invert one of these momentum conjugate relations. The other one, uh, for instance, you can combine two fields, we're perfectly fine, you even combine them and redefine things so that you appear with a fourth order, uh, high order term in your Lagrange, but actually it's because there are two different fields that have been combined artificially into one. Uh, it's a long story, I just want to say that there are some degenerate cases in which that problem is avoided. Uh, the instability is there, but you can also invent uh, Lagrangia with the disinstability and then tune the parameters, the free coupling terms, so that the stability is there, but maybe it takes an infinite time of a longer time, than, a time longer than the universe age for this instability to develop. I'm not sure this works on every quantum level, but at least you can imagine that there is an instability, but maybe it doesn't affect our universe, at least observationally. And by the way, the proof assumes locality, so if you really want to insist on a <coughs> totally non-local, not a trivial non-local, the one that you can localize in some way, but a, a fundamental non-locality, then I think there's no such a theorem. I don't know if there is anything else that will replace it. So assuming that this is valid, we stick to second order. It's definitely a good choice. Still, it's a mess. As uh, Alessandra uh, pointed out in this nice plot, even taking into account all this, you can still have a huge amount of possible theories. As, as we say, because there are plenty of at least four completely free functions of phi and, and x, and on top of that, you can also play with biometric theories, uh, uh, massless spin through gravitons, uh, and a few other things, and vector theories that I didn't even discuss. Even if they themselves will have a, a sort of hordensky lagrangian for vector and massless th and, 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 and by gravity theory, so you cannot, even in that case, uh, you are limited, even in that case, to some uh, sector, some possibilities, then still the landscape, the theoretical landscape is still very big. So let's see if we can make a, a progress in that using what we like to use, data. So now I will spend a few slides trying to show you that uh, what is interesting to do, and this is uh, possible so to some level, is to combine observation of uh, background, linear, and I will not discuss, but also possibly non-linear perturbation to reconstruct as much as, much as possible the ordensky lagrangian This is one of the main goals of Dark Energy research. We imagine that Dark Energy is something more complicated than lambda, therefore we want to reconstruct what it is. And we see, essentially I want to discuss at to which extent we can uh, go along this line. Uh, and you see, I'm not starting from a particular model and try to constrain parameters. That's of course, is an important way to proceed. I'm actually rather trying to see whether we can use data to reconstruct what the model is without, with a minimum of assumptions. Of course, you have to make still many assumptions. Homogeneity, linear perturbation, so on and so forth. But let's see if we can proceed, if we assume only a perturbed, perturbed free marombers for worker metric, 
some pressureless matter, because we think there is pressureless matter around us, and some unknown field that we call for simplicity, Hordensky field. So it's already constrained to obey a uh, Hordensky Lagrange. As big as it is, the Hordensky Lagrange is still an interesting, important uh, uh, constraint on the nature of the field. So let's assume we have this. Let's see how far we can proceed. And I, we now use concepts that have been already illustrated, like uh, baryon acoustic oscillation, things, but I will use really a very peculiar, very specific purpose. So I will not discuss too much, but really I try to make a general uh, story, you know, just um, a narrative of how this could go on, on a theoretical basis. So a BAO, a baryon acoustic oscillation, is a standard ruler for us we need for, 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 for what I need to say. It's really like a, a distance, um, a standard road, which is somewhere in the universe, actually, is everywhere. The scale of 120 megaparsec, whatever that is. Uh, it depends on fundamental physics of the early universe. It depends on how baryons interact with photons. And this is one of the few things that we really know, because we can make photons interact with baryons in our laboratory. So we assume that that doesn't change much. They interact in the same way. Of course, if you try to change that, then you end up uh, modifying the entire early history of the universe, and that would be a mess. So let's assume that at least baryons and photons interacting the way we think they do. In that case, the baryon acoustic oscillation gives you a standard ruler, which is really like putting a ruler on the sky and measuring this angle that you can measure. This is something that you keep fixed. It's exactly like the magnitude of a supernovae. You know that it's fixed, even if maybe you don't even know the size. In, in the case of BO, we even know the size, but you simply have to assume that there is a, a constant ruler somewhere, and then imagine you have a galaxy here, you have a galaxy there that you can observe. Of course, the, what you do in practice is much more, it's a statistical analysis of the entire power spectrum, but really, uh, intuitively, is exactly what it would be. Then you can measure the angular diameter distance, which is simply r over theta, and this is essentially the same integral that I showed you many times, with some little complications, which are really minor complications. So it's again this powerful integral uh, multiplied by the curvature itself. That's one thing you can do. But then there's another thing you can do. You can put the ruler along the line of sight. And then again, imagine there is a source here, a galaxy here, a galaxy there. So you know this ruler, you can observe the end side of this ruler, and therefore you measure another quantity directly, h of z, which is the z over r. So you know the redshift of an object there, the redshift of an object, object there, then you get this ratio here. That means you measure h of z directly. Now, this is uh, everywhere in the literature, but um, I really want to, you know, the, as you say, this structure and structure, what people normally do, and try really to go to the bottom. That's what it really can be done. Of course, it has to be done in a statistical way, and of course, it has to rely on the fact that there is a BAO, uh, there is a, a standard ruler, and this is the, the BAO scale, in this case, written in terms, uh, shown in terms of the correction function, previous lecturers has shown it in terms of uh, power spectrum, but it's exactly the same story. There is a distance which we assume is given by fundamental physics uh, that we think is nothing to do with dark energy, will not be affected by the existence of a, a field, the scalar field, uh, even gravity is not essentially important for that, has to do really with propagation of waves in a plasma of uh, baryons and, and photons. So essentially, you have to play this role, ex uh, to play this game, except statistically. You have to look for standard distances in the distribution of galaxies, and that's all the problem of finding the power spectrum and identify this peak. But once you do so, you discover that you measure two things, H and this. And since H is there as well, meaning that if you know this and H, you also know omega k, because there's also this factor omega k. And Interestingly, that's all you need to define the full friedman robles walker metric. All you need is A and H naught to today, but this is a different story. Let's assume that today we can measure H naught. You need curvature and you need the expansion rate. And though you have exactly both of them. So the, the bottom line of this is that by assuming the existence of standard rulers, we can, in principle of course, but that's exactly what we do uh, every day when we analyze data, we do this in a statistical way, we can, in principle, figure out the full friedman roberts walker metric at every epoch, at every epoch in which we can make observations. Now, this is an amazingly powerful statement. Uh, I'm surprised that it's not stressed enough in the literature, in my opinion, because it's really amazing. We, we, can, we can measure the geometry of the universe without essentially any free parameter left, but just combining observations. 
All right, so from now on, I could assume that this can be done or has been done to some precision. You see, I'm really skipping over the question of systematics and things. So I'm trying to make a proof of principle now. And uh, so we assume that at least this has been, has been solved, this problem, or can be solved relatively straightforwardly to figure out the geometry of the universe at the background level, of course. And you can complement with S supernovae 1A, but will not change the picture. We just in in increase the statistics, but will not change the picture and will not tell you anything more. You cannot combine background observables to get directly in a question of state. You have to assume many other things. So you see, there's no word equation of state in all my last uh, 20 slides because that's really not a fundamental quantity. Of course, that's not enough and we have to go to perturbations. Now again, here, of course, is a long way. One should go and I will not and the long way is shortened if you realize that there is a, a general linear scalar metric which only includes these two potentials and has been quoted already by a previous speaker, like Fir. And you have uh, two potentials if you don't assume them to be, to have any special relation. That depends on space and time, so there will be a function of space and time. And then what you have to do is take the metric, it's only the scalar part, we are neglecting gravitational waves and vector perturbations for good reasons. You take this, put inside the Einstein machine uh, with uh, every possible modification due to our desk, insert, linearize, solve. That's what you have to do, right? And you end up with a uh, huge set, uh, not huge, but uh, not many equations, but rather complicated with many free, free equations, many free, free parameters and many terms. But all I need to point out is that when you do so, you get, not unexpectedly, on small scales, a Poisson equation, or something that looks a lot like Poisson equation, is identical to a Poisson equation if you really go to sub-horizon scales, and you realize that these two fields are actually in standard, uh, I didn't write anywhere, so that's in standard gravity. If you do that for standard gravity, uh, you discover that these two fields are actually identical up to a sign, and fortunately people put signs and definition in all possible contradictory ways, well, contradictory, different ways, symbolic ways. And uh, whenever I write this equation, people ask, how can you always, there's always somebody that says, well, how can you put a perturbation variable, a denominator, a perturbation variable is a random variable, maybe it's Gaussian distributed, so certainly can cross zero, that doesn't make sense. Very good point, but all perturbation variables in my, in my derivation are root mean squares, so they're the positive definite quantities. Uh, every time we write down this equation, we mean this. We don't say that explicitly, but we mean that. Anyway, that's not an important point. All I want to say is that all these mess of equations in simple Einstein gravity and sub-horizon limit reduces to Poisson and the fact that the two fields are uh, identical up to perhaps minus change due to neutrino, uh, uh, the anthropic stress introduced by, by neutrinos, which that will not play a role for what I want to say. All right. But now we don't have Einstein gravity. Now we have something much more complicated. The story so far is that we have something like this. So we should play exactly the same... Uh, sorry, let me give a second. If I can... Yeah, no, I prefer. Let's change the monitor. I have a better view. Good. Um, so but now we have this. So we should do exactly the same. But it's much more complicated. There's plenty of free functions, G2, G3, K, and so on. Will we end up in a total uncontrollable mess? Fortunately not, because these two equations get modified in a phenomenological simple way. The Poisson equation gets a correction like this. Now, depending on whether you put Psi here or you write a similar Poisson equation for Phi, then either you have Y, either you have this, or you have Y multiplied by this. But the point I want to say is that you end up with the same two equations, except now there is a, a new factor here and a new factor, uh, a new quantity there. And you define this to be an isotropic stress. And unfortunately, this is defined in many different ways with uh, maybe a one or a different uh, combination of phi and psi. I even suspect that I inverted phi and psi from one slide to the other. <laughs> there are <laughs> as many definitions as others around, <laughs> but they're all identical, of course. So the crucial point is that we end up, even in Hordesky, with just two new free functions. All of cosmology at the sub-horizon scale and assuming that the energy doesn't cluster too much, this is actually an important assumption, which I tend to skip over, but it's important, uh, reduces to just two new parameters. So it's like as if instead of discussing just H and maybe delta rho over rho, now we have to discuss the H, delta rho over rho, and Y, 
and it. And these are just to, as defined to be unity in Einstein and not unity in all the other theories. So now you can make lists. You can take your favorite theories, F of R, and write down what this Y is and what eta is. And they will depend on background variables. They all depend on background variables, but you have, then you have to solve for the background variables, but that's the easy part of the story. You solve for them and you get a Y and the eta that, of course, will depend on, on, uh, on, on time, on A, a scale factor, and also on scale. So there will be f a free function, as I mentioned a moment ago, of uh, uh, scale factor, time, and, 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 and space, and wavelength. Uh, right. And this, you can do that for every theory you like. Some expressions are so long that I didn't even care to write them explicitly. You can find in references. And the standard gravity is unity. So one of the problems of the energy research, uh, one of the most interesting ones, in my opinion, is to see whether this is one or whether there's something else going on, and perhaps to reconstruct as a function of time and space. Now, again, it seems that uh, we ended up in a mess because now there is a y and eta for every model, so we have to be specific for every model, and then we didn't gain much. But now comes the, maybe the most important slide for this part of the lecture. In fact, in the so-called quasi-static limit, which means, again, that energy doesn't cluster much, every Hordensky model can be rewritten in a parametric, simple way. Eta and y are just functions of scale, k squared, and five free functions, h1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that only depend on time, their background variables, what well, this is the space dependence. This has been derived by several authors. So all of the complexity of Hordensky, and I must say essentially all of the, all, all of the complexity of other energy field uh, in, in this scalar, uh, scalar version, but amazingly this works also for the vector and the, and the massive uh, version, tensor tensor version, but I will not discuss that, can be compressed into two functions which have the same structure and the simple dependence on k squared. Now, the dependence on H is terribly complicated because what happened to our original G and things? Well, they happen to be there. This H depends on these W's, these W's depend on G. So if you have a theory that you like uh, with a given specific G4, G5, G3, you can put them here, put them there, and derive the H. But you understand from this relation, even without looking at them too much in detail, which I advise you not to, not to do, <laughs> is that uh, it's uh, practically impossible from these four or five functions, five, to reconstruct everything because they mess it up in an uh, irret irretrievable way. But not all hope is lost, as I will tell you in a second. Just to say that there is a direct connection. So once you have your, your theory, you can obtain this h, this uh, y and theta. Uh, y and eta in a direct way. And now comes another in, in interesting slide, I would say. Remember, we started from Yukawa potential in lecture one. And finally, we go back to Yukawa potential. If we have these quantities, they modify the Poisson equation, let's call them both of them Poisson equation, for psi and five, they have the form of Poisson equation. There is this y, and now because I use the other potential, I have to combine y with eta, but that's the whole point. There are only these two quantities. This is in momentum space, in Fourier space. I should go. I would like to go back to real space. You just make an anti-Fourier transform, so some integral of uh, of k and uh, the plane wave, and lo and behold, you get a uh, Yukawa expression for a point particle. So if you have a point particle, this point particle, due to this extra interaction, will uh, produce not just a Newtonian potential, but a Newtonian potential with some correction. When now finally this Q and M or beta and, and m I introduced at the beginning, have a specific realization in your desk. It's this combination of h and, 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 and the range. You see, the range is the same, the mass of this scalar field, and the strength is similar, but not identical. There is a difference. So in fact, we have two. We started with one Yukawa term, and now we have two Yukawa terms. One that has to do with the G00 part of the metric, and one we have, has to do with the space part of the metric. They're both similar, but they have different couplings. Constant in front of it in the same range. So now this links this part of the lecture with the beginning. Testing uh, Yukawa term in laboratory, it's a first way to test for density theories, except the laboratory is not really the best way because uh, it's small scales and cosmological scales, there could be screening. There are many reasons why we cannot directly use laboratory results 
for doing cosmology. But essentially the problem is the same. We have to invent a, 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 a torsion balance, a Cavendish tor torsion balance at the cosmological scales in order to be able to measure these two potentials and, the, and their correction with respect to Newtonian gravity. All right, so um, let's go a bit deeper on the mathematical structure. I will then continue from here, so later on. Uh, let's go a bit deeper, because now there's something we can do, actually. It's very interesting to do. It's, a, it's an elegant way, not just elegant, but useful, to derive the perturbation equation, which is to write down the Lagrangian at second order. Because if you write the perturbed Lagrange at second order, when you differentiate it, when, when you find the Euler-Lagrange equation, you derive the first order uh, perturbation equations, which are our perturbation equations, linear perturbation equations. It's not normally is not done in textbooks, but it's a, it's a way to do it, and it's actually very convenient for a reason that I will tell you in a second. But if you want to try, you take, uh, uh, you, 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 you take your uh, generalized uh, metric um, perturbed metric, it's just in Minkowski to, to simplify things, but now you have to take everything, including the part that we normally neglect because of gauge conditions. If you do so, you can rewrite Hilbert, Einstein Hilbert Lagrange in this strange way, and you see second order, every term is second order in the perturbations. And now you can derive all the Lagrange equation by differentiating with respect to every, by varying, sorry, with respect to every uh, perturbation variable, and you end up with the standard perturbation theory. But you get something more, because some of these will give you constraints, and when you work out all the constraints, you can identify the propagating degrees of freedom, which is a propagating degree of freedom is a field with two time derivatives in the second order Lagrangia once all the constraints have been taken into account. So the procedure is write down the second order Lagrangia, for instance, for Odensky and for Einstein, not without making any gauge choice. You can do that only later on. Then uh, work out all the constraints. Uh, some, of, some of the Euler Lagrange equations will actually be constraints just because the quantity will appear first order. And then one of them, for instance, E, appear just as E and not as E squared. So when you take uh, uh, Euler Lagrange equation, that will give you ra gives rise to a constraint, and not to an equation. A constraint, and not a, a, a propagating equation. But at the end, you can identify, doing this, the real propagating degrees of freedom, the quantities that really obey uh, uh, field equation propagated with two time derivatives. And remember, two time derivatives is crucial because all of this is second order. That way, you can identify the real degrees of freedom. For instance, you, the famous well-known statement that standard gravity contains no scalar degree of freedom, but two tenths of degree of freedom, the two polarization states of gravitational waves, can be seen explicitly doing this operation. Otherwise, it's really hard to see it directly from writing down Einstein equation. If you write down Ordensky, what, what could you expect? Well, gravity still is there, G mu nu is still there, so you still have to wait for, you have to still have to expect two tenths of degrees of freedom, beside matter, not considering matter now. Matter will has its own degrees of freedom. And on top of that, there is a new field, so you should expect a new propagating scalar degree of freedom. That's what you find. If you do this exercise with massive gravity, you discover other combinations, and so on and so forth. You can classify all theories with all fields, not just scalar, but do this operation and identify the propagating degrees of freedom, scalar or non scalar, whatever they are. And if you do that for Ordensky, you discover that this operation gives rise to uh, an, uh, an, uh, an action which will look like this, although I think I missed this, uh, is an exponent 2 here, which I mean, sorry, is a typo. Um, so you see, there is a, a canonical Lagrangian for a scalar field and a sort of canonical Lagrangian for the two polarization state of the tensor field. Now this is the expansion using all of the perturbation, not just the scalar part. So it's the most general perturbed metric, including scalar vector and tensor perturbation at second order. And you get, and once you take all the, all the constraints into account, you get a super simplified Lagrangia, which is only valid to second order, and you can see directly that at the end where you canonize, make canonical the various terms, is a canonical scalar field and a canonical uh, field, which is not scalar, is actually the two polarization states. And you see explicitly many things. You see explicitly which field will obey a, a wave equation after all. What is it? It's a wave equation for phi and h. And now you see interesting properties. You see, for instance, that there will be an overall factor for the scalar part, an overall factor for the tensor part, and there will be a sound speed, a propagated sound speed for the scalar field, 
and also propagating sound speed for the gravitational waves, for the tensors. So we discover many things, for instance, that in Hordensky, gravitational waves can propagate with a speed which is different from the one of light, it can be a CT, and that has to be one of the fundamental uh, quantities uh, that appear in, in this Lagrange. We can even count how many things, we, how many new functions we have, because I mean, this is written as a constant, but uh, this will depend on background variables, so they depend on time. So there's one, two, three, four free functions, plus there's one for the background, it gives you five free functions. Now these free functions are really close to observation, they're really what you can, in principle, directly observe, are not any longer the original five, three, uh, four free functions of the Lagrange. There is a relation between them, but now I'm forcing the whole Lagrangian to appear in a form that be, can be, in principle, directly compared. For instance, we can observe the velocity of propagation of gravitational waves and compare to this. I will come back to this uh, in various points, actually. So, all I did so far is say that we can discuss perturbations, we can discuss in many ways, a very insightful way is to der derive this uh, kind of simplified Lagrange, which is only valid to second order, but you can really read the various terms, identify the degrees of freedom, understand what you have to do in order to measure these quantities. There are many things one can say about that, but uh, maybe I don't want to... Okay, let me we'll proceed a little bit. Um, another reason why it's so useful to do that is because now, the sense that this is canonical, then we would like, and again, there's a missing two here, sorry. Then we would like to have, uh, uh, then we it's easy to directly uh, in, in impose stability conditions. For instance, you want the kinetic term to be positive definite, so you want Qs for scalar and Qt for tensor to be positive. And also you want a positive square sound speed, so you want this to be positive. You want to have a, uh, a, a sound speed which is positive, so square, so the sound speed should not be imaginary. And again, it's a stability condition. So directly writing down the equation in this way, and, and noticing that the once it's written, the form of the equation of motion is, is essentially a wave equation in Fourier space, you immediately can impose the important stability condition. But it's still missing what is the relation between all these new, new quantities and the original Lagrangian, and I'll discuss that uh, in a moment. So these are formal developments, nothing new essentially, but many very important, very uh, give you lots of uh, um, information. So, what is the how we connect this with the original Lagrange, which is again this one here? Well, there are several ways. A very convenient one that has been <coughs> introduced by Bellini and Sevisky a few years ago is to define. Uh, remember, I, I told about five functions. In fact, there are five functions which are called alpha m, alpha k, alpha b, and alpha t. And then there is the Planck mass itself, which is our fifth function, which is uh, uh, it's a, it's not a constant now, will uh, vary, so it's a kind of variable Planck mass. And again, not look too much at these equations. All I want to say is that these parameters capture, combine all the G3. Oh, by the way, I remember if I said that, that was important. Sorry if I didn't mention. This G3x means derivative with respect to x. G45 means derivative with respect to G4, derivative of G4 respect to phi, and so on and so forth. This means two derivative respect to x, and so they all come directly from the original Hordesky Lagrange. So again, if you have this, if you have a model, or you want to be general, then you can compress all this information into just f uh, f five free functions, and of course, they have to explain everything. So this QS, CS, QT, there must be function of those five things. There cannot be anything else. And they are, and you can write them explicitly. So which means that if you want to have the tensor part to be stable, then this quantity has to be positive. If you want the, the speed of propagation of gravitational waves to be unity, then this alpha T, which is the one I gave a moment ago, uh, has, to be, has to be zero, because if this is not zero, then the, sound speed, the propagation velocity of the, sound, of the gravitational waves will be not unity and you want this to be positive, so there are plenty of stability conditions. Which, if you remember, when I started introducing the Hordensky, I say, well, Hordensky is the one that uh, is stable and something like that, but it's not necessarily stable. It's a, it's a, it's a theory that w will not contain uh, an obvious instability, not contain Gauss, not contain uh, something which is not, uh, has no ground state. It's fine, but still you have to impose many conditions in order to make it viable. But the conditions are very rough, general. 
a condition not such that uh, this Lagrangian cannot exist, all these terms to be ruled out, but simply that some combination of this G3, G4 has to be, uh, give a positive quantity here, another positive quantity there, and so on and so forth. So there are still some broad condition, which essentially turns out to be things like masses of particles should be positive, and propagation and uh, the canonical kinetic term should be positive definite, and so on and so forth. So these are broad conditions. If I had started with a fourth order theory, I would have simply obtained that there would be no way to get positivity definition for, for instance, energy. There are many other parametrizations beyond the Benisa Visk, it's not so important, but there is a dictionary to translate uh, this parametrization into others. For instance, uh, I like the, well, there are many others, so you can go from one to the other, but it's really not particularly important. Now, um, let me see if I want to. Um, well, I just mentioned that uh, so far I tried to be, I tried to go the simple way, I mean, relatively simple, which is to say that everything is Ordensky. Of course, <laughs> never is like that in, in physics. You can go beyond your desk in various ways. Just to, to give a flavor of this, I discuss only the gravitational part. How about the matter part? You can go beyond your desk discussing a bit more in detail the famous, you know, the conservation equation, which I wrote there, the famous continuity Euler and Poisson equation that we, that we study uh, in, uh, very early in, in, in physics course. Um, but you can modify them and see whether you want to, you can generalize, for instance, by adding a non-conservation term. This, by the way, is the sub-horizon version of the conservation equation. Therefore, you can introduce a, a new parameter, which is not one of the, four, the five, but it's alpha h. So this one way, complicate a bit the matter sector, but essentially that gives you only one new parameter. You can add several Hordensky fields. Why there should be only one? There could be several Hordensky fields. That would be really un unfair to, to us. But uh, it's possible that there are several forms of dark energy and they just happen to be important together. In that case, you get more complicated Y and Dita with higher order terms. Or you can go along with introducing torsion, metricity, palatini, or vector intensity, which actually, fortunately, vector intensity modify the, the Ordensky, but they themselves have a, a overall Lagrangian, so it's not. Uh, and then you can go on adding tensor tensor. So there are several ways. I certainly don't want to discuss this. Interestingly, in many cases, not in all of them, in many cases, even if you modify, for instance, you use a new tensor field, rather a new scalar field, again, because you are not free to just invent Lagrangian, you are free to invent, but then you have to worry about uh, what you're putting in, stability condition, then you discover that even if you start with a tensor tensor field, in order to make it consistent or stable and things, you have to define a Lagrangian for that, which is again second order, and magically, even for a tensor tensor field, you end up with the same structure, just different uh, H quantities. And, well, I mentioned speed of gravitational waves, and this has been measured. So we know at least one thing very clearly, very, very uh, powerfully, recently, that apparently gravitational waves propagate with exactly the same velocity as light, because of simultaneous detection of gravitational waves and gamma rays from the same event. This is the event of gravitational wave, and just immediately after, you got an event of gamma ray burst Pro from the same source, that's what we assume. So they arrive essentially simultaneously. The only explanation, since they come from really very far, is that they have exactly the same velocity, an incredible precision. Now, of course, this is a measurement, is one measurement, and only fat made recently, in the sense that the redshift of the source was not very large, so let's say it's a local universe uh, uh, quantity, local universe constraint on, on CT, on the velocity of propagation, but uh, it's a powerful one, it's extremely tight, so typically everybody assumes this term to be zero. And now if you work out what that means <coughs> in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, Hordensky, it means that this combination of derivatives has to be zero. And now you, it's hard to play Imagine that this and this and it at zero just today or sometime. It's almost impossible. You get the different functions, why they should be equal only for one second and not before and later. We just measure it at the moment. So essentially, the only reasonable way is that not only this combination is zero, but separately, each one of these terms is zero. Otherwise, it will be difficult to combine them and just magically get at zero for one, for one second. So essentially, to have the single measurement of the gravitational wave speed to be unity immediately killed half of the Ordensky. 
G5 has to be zero, because there's no derivative here, no derivative there. It could be a constant, but if it is a constant, it can be reabsorbed into the other terms. And the derivative of G with respect to X must be zero, which means G4 cannot depend on X. This is the kind of game we would like to play. But unfortunately, so far, has been successful only for this uh, single observation. But this is exactly what we like to, 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 to continue doing. Get some information and then say, ha G4 has to be this, G5, and maybe we would like to get general condition like this. Sometimes has to be totally absent or have to have a specific form. Okay, still, this is very powerful because uh, poor Hordesky has been already uh, killed in half. All this term has to be absent, this term has to be zero, and this dependence cannot be there. So we are left with the most general variable up to some level, uh, with, a, with a, a caveat that we mentioned a second, the most general variable of Densky, which is these three things. That's already a big step forward, but still there's plenty of freedom there. And even this big step forward has a couple of caveats. One is that the speed has been measured only essentially at very small ratio, so you can still invent a model possibly with an attractor. For instance, a model which starts with aggression with speed which is different from unity, and uh, and from C, from of light, it's different in the past and goes to uh, Unity today with an attractor mechanism. So in such a way that doesn't depend this on the initial condition. The Y would be a mess. Is a question there? Yes. Yes. Sure, sure, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's no constraint. A, a priori, there's no constraint on that. All right. So, so again, I insist on this because we have a we wrote a paper in which we have shown that you can indeed have a mechanism such that uh, uh, automatically, from every initial condition, you end up with c equal unity, c t equal unity, at some point. And if that point is in the past, it means that you can explain the observation. Still, have something interesting in the in. in if the point is recently, you can explain the CT equal unity today, but still have something going on in the past. Except you can do that, you can invent a model with these attractors, it was fun to derive it, but the model is uh, frankly a bit uh, ugly, so it contains strange powers of uh, potential and things like that. Uh, Feminists, really? Okay. Um, okay, so um, now I essentially we spend the last lecture to put things together and see how we can measure this y and theta. Actually, we focus only on eta, which is the interesting part. I will show you how you can combine practically all the observation of cosmology, well, um, most of the important ones, gravitational lensing and galaxy clustering and, uh, <coughs> and um, supernovae, uh, to obtain directly eta in a kind of model independent, meaning that I don't not specify eta for this or that model, but for the most general viable Hordensky theory, which is kind of the most general thing we can do. So I will do that in the next uh, lecture, I guess. And this one, I just, uh -huh, okay, probably not that time, but let me start doing this, because, I w because now I would like to, to mention something that I'm a bit excited about that can be done uh, uh, with this, uh, having in mind this, but uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, side way, um, because I remember we mentioned H of Z, I say, well, that suppose that that is done by bearing acoustic oscillation, but actually, that's not completely true because there are many ways why the baryon acoustic oscillation themselves, even if they are standard ruler, cannot measure directly h of z unless you make some assumption on the shape of the power spectrum. For instance, that the wiggles that you see on the power spectrum are really primordial due to baryon acoustic oscillation or something else, that you have under control the shape, that nonlinearity doesn't play much of a role. So there are many reasons why you could, uh, you could have uh, some problem with that. So I wanted to show a different way. Maybe I could have used this at the, be at the beginning because it's not necessary to do with Dordesky, but it's a new way of measuring H of Z. Uh, but now I'm worried because uh, <laughs> I'm starting a new idea, and so maybe <laughs> a few minutes more. So, okay, let me let me just four minutes. Yes. Okay. Well, finish. <laughs> finish is a big word. I can proceed to a, 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 a point at which I can stop. So. All right, so now, uh, really, this is a, is a um, uh, parenthesis, and I want to show an interesting, relatively new way of measuring cosmology, which has to do with Ordensky, as I said, but it's more general than that. And the idea is that standard candles can be used in other ways. They give us the luminosity distance, 
But now I'm interested in showing you that the scatter around Z can also give us the peculiar velocity. In fact, if this is a, a supernova that is a cosmological redshift here, and uh, uh, there is a, there is a, they have a peculiar velocity, as we know, this peculiar velocity will add to the cosmological redshift. But now imagine two standard candles which are in the same location. Imagine two standard candles at the same location with respect to us. They have at the same uh, cosmological redshift, they are at the same location. So they should have exactly the same uh, magnitude because they are standard candles. But they don't. If you look at the, at the plot, at the scatter plot, of course there is a scatter of supernovae along the mean. Now this scatter should be done essentially, entirely, should be attributed essentially entirely to uh, their own peculiar velocities because they are supposed to be standard candles. Of course, on top of that, there is the intrinsic scatter of the calibration of supernovae, there is some lensing effect, there is perhaps some systematics. But the point I want to make is that the peculiar velocity field is imprinted on the, on the, on the supernovae, except it is imprinted on the scatter rather than on the mean. So what is noise, as usual, for the previous generation of people working on the supernovae can become signal for us because we can now exploit this variance here to see whether there is a peculiar velocity field. And that peculiar velocity field, as I show in a moment, will contain lots of interesting cosmological information. This test uh, has been not be done yet with uh, real data because it requires many supernovae, but it's an interesting possibility. So the idea is that uh, this luminosity distance contains a cosmological part and a peculiar velocity part, and the peculiar velocity part can be isolated, uh, assuming that this is a small correction with respect to that. So this scatter on the luminosity distance, which translates into a scatter on the Hubble diagram, can be related to the peculiar velocity field. And maybe I stop at this point. You can write a relation between the scatter of the luminosity distance with uh, uh, proportion to the velocity, the peculiar velocity of the supernovae, and the cosmological factor, which is this. And you can also relate, on the other hand, remember, in a Hubble diagram, a scatter in luminosity, in, in, in luminosity distance, means a scatter in magnitude, right? They are related. So you can say that the scatter in luminosity distance can be written as a scatter in magnitude. So at the end, measuring a scatter in magnitude is a way to measure a peculiar velocity of a standard candle. And there must be the assumption of standard candle, otherwise two objects would be at the same, uh, could have uh, a luminosity which is totally unrelated to, to their distance. Right? Well, unrelated, the, the, the magnitude will not be a proof of the distance because the, the absolute magnitude could be different. So it had to, you, this can be only be done if you have a standard candle such that the, the amount of luminosity is the same. So the flux you receive is directly proportional to the velocity. So this is powerful because it means that the scatter supernovae up to some overall factor, can we give you information on the peculiar velocity field? And this can be measured with the uh, uh, with, uh, next uh, generation service of supernovae, because the point is that you need uh, thousands of them, several thousand. But maybe, uh, maybe I should stop here, otherwise I'm going to many things. Okay, thanks for... <laughs> Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, you mostly discussed <coughs> Hortensky model in uh, linear regime, but I wonder, is there any peculiar features for high density regions, maybe around black holes in mm. Hortensky model or something like that? Yes, for instance, people derive recently the waveform of gravitational waves for a Hordensky theory, actually for exactly the one I mentioned late at the end, so the variable, let's call it uh, Hordensky theory. And you can derive a modified waveform of uh, gravitational waves will depend on, 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 on the two mergers, on the two objects. Unfortunately, if they are both black holes, you will not see it, because black holes should have no hair, so should have no, keep no trace of that. But if one of them is a neutron star and the other one is a black hole, then there is a, an interesting difference. And then the merging, this merging will introduce a modified waveform, which can be directly, in principle, observed. So that's one way to answer your question. Otherwise, yes. But there is always the question of screening. You might, uh, it might be that uh, all local effects a screen. Even this merging uh, screening is supposed to be not relevant, otherwise you will not see it. So, yes, the answer is yes, but uh, I always be a bit skeptical in taking a result from local gravity and transfer it to cosmology. Okay, thank you. See.
Uh, interesting idea. Um, have you considered also environmental effects? Um, there was a paper 2013 by Pearl Motors team saying that um, uh, it could have a 3% effect in H0 by uh, considering whether a supernova is happening within a, a spiral arm or more in the outskirts. Could that have an effect on this? I guess it could. So we try to be, in the estimate that we'll maybe be able to give you, we try to be very conservative in the sense that uh, we, uh, so the point is, the reason why you can isolate this effect is not because you're really measuring all the other systematic things, but because this peculiar velocity field is correlated to the density distribution. So this has a correlation which the other effect cannot have. Every effect which depends on supernovae will not be correlated with another supernovae which is somewhere else. So the idea that you can isolate this, I should be able to overcome also this problem, but you haven't looked at it in detail. I guess you would expect a uh, different scatter as a, fun as a um, function of redshift. Yeah, but will not be correlated from here to there, you see. While this effect is peculiar velocity, and peculiar velocity, a linear regime is totally correlated with the matter distribution. So, I, don't oh, know if I, I mean, because of the cosmic evolution, you expect uh, on redshift, yes. yes. But now I'm talking fix a redshift for a second. Yeah. Just consider supernovae in the sky. This effect, this peculiar velocity, just a peculiar velocity, the redshift, dis redshift distortion, the power spectrum, is an effect that correlates points at different parts in the sky. It's actually part of the power spectrum. Every other effect, the local, cannot have this property. Although, frankly, I didn't consider that in detail because we just summarize everything. Say there is. Uh, intrinsic scatter that we don't that we take into account as an overall package without going into detail. Okay. Uh, I have a question regarding all this beyond the desk stuff. Yes. Like I had the feeling that maybe not everything is beyond the desk, but something is next to our desk. It's uh -huh. just an alternative rather than uh -huh. an extension. Like I don't know, for instance, Palatini stuff so Let's change. Uh, I mentioned Paladini. Yeah, yeah. Like ah. let's change the degree of freedom. So, to what degree has that been studied? Ah. Is it uh, fundamentally different? Is it just slightly different, the Lagrange? Okay, I confess that I have an uh, allergy to Paladini for <laughs> my and for no reason, for no reason, just because at some point it, enough is enough, you know. So uh, the answer is that I really don't know the detail. I mean, I studied that in the past. It's in my book. Uh, but I cannot give you the updated version. That's w once in a while I see people working on that. So uh, they are working yeah, on Yeah, yeah, sure, there okay. are. But frankly, I something that I didn't go over myself. So any answer would be really maybe oh, like 10 years old or something, so sorry. Okay, thanks. But yeah, it's a this question. Maybe next time I should study it a bit better. That. Uh, it happens almost every time I talk about this, there's one guy. But how about Palatini? <laughs> maybe it's time that I should go a bit uh, and study it carefully. Okay, any more and questions? Metricity yeah. and torsion, there are several others, of course. Thanks, Luca, for the nice lecture. What about, uh, ca can we use quasi-static to analyze CMB and isotropies? Well, what do you mean? You can have something that is, should be quasi-static today, but is not quasi-static in the past? No, I mean as... as a no, I understand, but as if you assume quasi-static to... As formalism. If we can use, well, I w no, I would mm -hmm. say no. Okay. I would say no, you should consider everything. For CMB in particular, yes. because certainly there are scales which are not sub horizon totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, that's the okay, thanks. The different things is whether you can assume the same parameterization that we use for quasi static at the CMB epoch, because that is a parameterization of the effects. You can say, I define new parameter, modify my, my equations. And um, I can assume them they have a similar structure like this, even if uh, they don't come from a quasi static. It's a bit shaky thing, but in, it's, a, it's a slightly different story. It's not exactly as assuming quasi static. It's uh, assuming a parameterization inspired by quasi static, even if you know that it doesn't come from quasi static. But the answer is certainly not. And in all codes, there's no this assumption. All the code, the Bolt Boltzmann codes, don't make the assumption of quasi static. Okay, thanks. Some last, some last naive question uh, regarding this new method to measure peculiar yes. velocities using the, 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 the distance modulus of supernovae. Do you mind going back to the slide where you were showing the data points? Yeah, so naively I would have, have expected that low redshifts, the contribution from the peculiar 
velocity redshifts would be more important at low redshift than at high redshifts, although I tend to see a higher... It's hard to see from this plot. It's hard to see. One reason why they appear obviously large is because, as I say, there's not just this effect. This is the one I will single out because it's correlated. But there are the intrinsic scatter and the measurement errors and lensing and things. So all of them essentially are Would more you, important, large redshift. So okay. I guess that the overall okay. reason is this one, yeah. Okay, so you say you need 1,000 supernova, the order of 1,000? Uh, we have already order of 1,000, it's not sufficient. It's not so my guess is 100,000. Okay. But it's um, half a generation away, so. Should be is already in our horizon to consider 100,000 supernovae. Unless there are more. Oh, this one more question. Mm, you mentioned that it could be possible to have several types of dark matter, and so dark I energy. But uh, is that the truth for that? Yeah, matter? and the same is the okay. The same question for dark energy. Yes, it's also possible. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. That's what I mentioned. So one of the beyond Ordensky is why we should have only one scalar field in the universe, whether it's dark matter uh, like uh, in the talk of Kfir or, or whether it's dark energy like in my talk. Uh, still, you can have several scalar fields and they can do different things. The nice thing about Ordensky is that if you have two Ordensky fields, I mean two fields that obey two addition, to add it to two Ordensky Lagrangian added to each other, the overall effect is just that my, my Y and eta just change uh, to a polynomial of to a, to a different form, which is not particularly different, so it's somehow still uh, possible to to work out uh, something useful. So, if you have several fields, you have a ratio polynomial. So many more parameters, of course. So the answer, yes, it's the only question that, of course, is very unlikely that not only there are two fields, uh, but there are probably several fields, but they're all both important, active, and do cosmology at the same time. That's what is probably unlikely. And is it possible to have different uh, gravitational wave speed at different redshift for the qubit that you show? Yes, so in general, the sound speed, the CT, all the quantities are time dependent. So definitely you can, and if you have several fields, you can have the, each one of them will have, no, sorry. If you have several fields, you have propagating degrees of freedom, scalar propagating degrees of freedom, but the gravitational part is the same. So there's only one gravitational wave propagation, but the, the, it can depend, it, it certainly depends on time. Except the reason why we say that this is zero at all times is because the constraint is so precise, you know, this 10 to minus 15 difference between C and CT, that is very unlikely that there's a mechanism that uh, makes this so identical today and different in the past, unless there is an attractor mechanism, and that's what we try to study. That, I'm answering your question? Yes. Thank you. All right, so I think it's time to head for, for lunch. Thank you. Let's thank Luca and the previous speaker again.